Portions of Aqua Kids have been produced with the cooperation of the National Estuarine Research Reserve System. Welcome to our Great Lakes adventure. Over the next few months, we will be exploring Lake Erie and Lake Superior, along with their tributaries and coastal areas. We'll be highlighting the many programs, dedicated researchers, organizations, and individuals working to keep those fragile ecosystems healthy and productive. So, ready to make a difference? Building a better planet starts with you. Welcome to Aqua Kids. We're kicking off our Great Lakes adventure right here in Cleveland, Ohio, the flashpoint for the environmental movement to clean up America's waterways. Our day started aboard the LC2, a water taxi for the Cleveland Metro Park system. We're here on the Cuyahoga River with Jen from Old Woman Creek Reserve. And Captain Mike from Cleveland Metro Parks. So guys, tell us a little bit about this city. Well, welcome to Cleveland, guys. Yes, we're on the Cuyahoga River, which um, is probably most famous for, for burning, which you wouldn't typically want in a river. No. Um, but because of its infamous burning in 1969, uh, it set in motion a lot of our environmental laws that protect the waterways of the, the United States, um, not just here in the Great Lakes. So what started the fire? So, see that bridge back there? Yeah, we have a lot of railroads going across uh, our waterways here, especially in the Cuyahoga. So when the trains would go by, unfortunately, there was a layer of pollution, um, usually chemicals that floated on the surface of the water. Oil and water don't mix. Sparks from the train tracks would fly off onto the water and ignite um, the pollution that was on there. Unfortunately, at that time, there weren't uh, laws and regulations that prevented uh, polluting of our waterways. So industry was allowed to put their waste directly into the river and to our Great Lake out there. The city of Cleveland began shipping operations at the Port of Cleveland in 1825. During its first year of operation, the port recorded $38,000 in exports and imports of $196,000. Today, the Port of Cleveland is one of the largest ports on the Great Lakes nearly 18,000 jobs, and $1.8 billion in annual economic activity are tied to the roughly 13 million tons of cargo that move through Cleveland Harbor each year. So Jen, what is the importance of shipping to the Great Lakes in the city of Cleveland? It's really important. So for our kind of landlocked areas of the Midwest and anything west of the Midwest, um, that's how we get goods to a lot of our areas. And um, some pretty sharp thinkers uh, back in the early 1800s saw the, the canals out in New York, how they connected the Hudson River to Lake Erie and thought, huh, that might work in Ohio. So they built a canal system along uh, the Cuyahoga River and eventually connected Lake Erie to the Ohio River. And once the Ohio River was connected to Lake Erie, then Lake Erie was connected to the Mississippi and even the Gulf of Mexico. So we were able to then get stuff in, get goods and services, the goods and products in um, from the Atlantic Ocean, um, all through the Great Lakes, and then down throughout the country via uh, our rivers. So it be because Cleveland was able to connect all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico, it made it the perfect hub for all these um, industries, particularly steel industries. We see some iron ore behind us, um, but a variety of, of industries um, were really thriving here in the early 1900s. Is there any downside to being connected to so many other places in the country? The downside is actually the same as the upside. It's the connectedness. Um, because we're connected, that opens us up to um, what we call invasive species. So we've had a lot of aquatic invasive species move into the Great Lakes because we're now so connected. Either they've come up from the Gulf where they've come in through the Atlantic um, and the St. Lawrence Seaway. So Jen, industry pretty much built Cleveland. Can you tell me where we are now? Yeah, so industry and location built this city. Um, this was once the sixth largest city in the United States around the early 1900s. 
and it was because it was located here on the edge of uh, Lake Erie and we could, the steel mills could easily get iron ore down from Lake Superior to uh, Cleveland and then ship it out. It was better located than Pittsburgh so it was the place to be. Uh, this was, we had 20 millionaires in the United States, 19 lived in Cleveland. This wow. was the epicenter of the United States. So other than iron ore, I see a lot of other things like gravel here. Are there other aspects of the industry that you can tell me about? Yeah, we have uh, gravel, there's some salt, there's big salt uh, flats under Lake Erie actually, and the salt is mined out and used for a variety of things, including road salt. Um, so that's very active as well. So this location here is kind of like the epicenter and the hub of all the trading that goes on. Yep, the big, the big ships come in here and pick stuff up, then they can carry it anywhere they need to go. That's sweet. We are aboard the Cleveland Metro Parks Water Taxi. Captain, tell us a little bit more about the services you provide. Well, the water taxi is used to transport people from the east bank of the west bank of the flats. We run that Thursdays through Sundays. And then we also offer two-hour river trips. So what do the water trips include? We offer a river taxi back and forth across the river from the east bank to the west bank. We also offer a two-hour river trip where we have a naturalist on board. So you do include history and science with the naturalist, correct? We do. Our naturalists talk about the history of the bridges, the uh, commercial and industrial history on the river, and how things have changed over the years. So come on down to Cleveland and check out the water taxi. Well guys, we have had a wonderful time on the Cuyahoga River today. So what have we learned, Andrew? I learned about Cleveland's industry then and now. I learned about the history of Cleveland. I learned about the 1969 River Fire. And you know what I've learned? It takes an awful long time to shoot a 30 minute show. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you guys so much. You know what guys? There's one thing you didn't learn. What's, What's that? that? No one asked me what Cuyahoga means. What, what does it mean? mean? It means the Crooked River. Yeah, huh. It sure was it crooked. crooked. It was crooked. Lots of turns. Now it's time for Aqua Quiz with your host, Drew Cruz. I'm your host, Drew Cruz, and it's time to test your knowledge with another aqua quiz. The Great Lakes are a series of interconnected freshwater lakes located primarily in the upper Midwest region of North America on the Canada-United States border. They connect to the Atlantic Ocean through the St. Lawrence River. Do you know how the Great Lakes were formed? Was it A, from giant meteors hitting the Earth, or B, glacial movement? We'll have the answer after the break. Welcome back. Have you come up with the answer as to how the Great Lakes were formed? The answer is B, glacial movement. The Great Lakes were formed nearly 20,000 years ago when the Earth's climate warmed and the last glacial continental ice sheet retreated. The glacier, up to two miles thick, was so heavy and powerful that it gouged out the Earth's surface to create the lake basins. We'll see you next week with another Aqua Quiz. Welcome back to Aqua Kids. 15,000 years ago, in this exact spot, I would have been a mile under ice. But now, all that's left are these rocky grooves. Here's David, and let's get the full story. Hey, Drew, how you doing? How are you doing? I'm doing great. So what do we have here, Isn't David? this cool? These are the best protected grooves in the world. Wow. Yeah, you said it. A mile of ice above us would have created so much pressure that it would have melted the surface right there and caused this whole glacier just to slowly slide. But it wouldn't have been filled with like a chalk and a powder and lots of stones to grind it up. And so that's what created these grooves that you see here. It's amazing. Now why just this exact spot? Why not the whole island and the whole, all well, of there, Lake Erie? Well, there were several grooves that were here, but the rest of them got quarried out because this island in the late 1800s was a huge site for uh, the industry of limestone quarrying. And so they quarried all the other ones out, and this is all the way we have left today. So David, how unique and well-preserved is this place here? This is one of the one of two sites left in the world, and this is one of the best-preserved ones. This whole stretch is so long. The other sites have been all quarried out around the world because the limestone has so much value for the commercial trade. Is this what it's always looked like since they dug it out? No, the cool part is that it was shiny when it came out. Can you imagine that? I mean, look at this surface now, and it, you can see it's all pitted. After, and it's only been exposed since the 70s when it really got exposed. Flashback to 360 million years ago. The place where I'm standing is completely underwater. Now flash forward to 60 years ago. This is a barren, desolate, rocky quarry. Let's find out how it got to be so green. Man, so tell me about this place. It looks extraterrestrial. Isn't this place so cool? Yeah. 
This is an Alvar. Alvar is a Swedish word for barren, and they got it right. I mean, this is so barren in here, yet there's so much history here. 360 million years ago, this Columbus limestone that we're standing on was a shallow sea filled with fish and corals. And then today, we've got these plants that move back in. In the meantime, though, to get it to where it looks like about 60 years ago, it was an industrial site. Imagine big machinery moving around, big steam engines moving limestone for cement and roads. Our industrial revolution was kind of slowing down a little bit, but they had quarried this place to beat the band. And yet all this green life has moved in. And we've got some really cool plants that have moved in. It is some of the coolest plants around. We've got federally threatened lakeside daisy in here. We've got some, a lot of state listed plants that can survive in this barren environment. And it's boom or bust in here. If it rains, you'll get wetland species that move in. And if it dries out, you get plants that have to be able to hack it out in that barren environment. So David, why don't you show me some of the top contenders here at the Alvar? All right, cool. Let's start with Lakeside Daisy. Cool. This is Lakeside Daisy right here. This is a federally threatened plant, meaning it is so restricted in its range, it's only from here up until the north side of Lake Huron. And there's only a few, about 100 populations or so. And it's got a yellow flower, and in the end of May, it's a beautiful daisy-like flower that flowers all over the place, growing out of this literally pea gravel. And that's the specific kind of environment that it needs. It needs this loose, open, cobble gravel. How deep are the roots? Really quite shallow because if you look you'll see some of this smooth this pavement barren that we call mm -hmm. here it can't get past it so it it's living in this alkaline environment that's yeah. not something we've talked about before but it's it's uh, because of the limestone it's a high pH it's got to be it's a tough plant. We introduced this about two years ago into here for seeds and look at it where today we've got plants all over the place so it is given the right habitat sort of a build it and they'll come and it's doing really great. So and it's that, not a native plant? It is native but uh, because of this environment was quarried out, mm -hmm. we've introduced it here to help uh, expand populations that we've got different places for it. Oh, look at that. Oh, there's a good one. Check it out. So cool, so cool. That's a horn coral. So here it is looking straight down. Imagine you took a rhino's horn and you're looking at the base looking straight down because here it is in cross section. That helps. You can see how that's, imagine a rhino horn right there. And so it was called a horn coral. And essentially all these little tubes that you're looking at are individual animals, because a coral is essentially a colony of animals. And this was a shallow sea 360 million years ago. So you look around, there's another one there, another one there, Jeez. and so on and on and on and on. And these things are everywhere throughout this Columbus limestone. It's such a cool environment. It's amazing, so old. Well, David, thank you so much for making the trek out here with me. It's amazing to see that life will always find a way. Hey man, my pleasure. Hi, Drew here. You know, it excites me to meet kids like us who love to protect the Earth as much as we do. Young people who are pioneering powerful ways to conserve and protect our planet. I call them eco-defenders. Let's find out what they're doing. Hi, this is Selena with eco-defenders. On today's episode, we're speaking with Luke, a volunteer for the Ian Summerhalder Foundation. Hi, Luke. Hi. Who is Ian Summerhalder and what is the Ian Summerhalder Foundation? He is an activist and actor. Right now you can watch him on The Vampire Diaries. ISF is a nonprofit and are all over the world. ISF's mission is to empower, educate, and collaborate with people and projects to positively impact the planet and its creatures. Why was the organization created? ISF was created because of our founder and president, Ian, grew up in Louisiana and was seriously affected by the BP oil spill in 2010. Ian was heartbroken to see his animals and homeland destroyed. So, Ian started ISF. How long have you been working with ISF, and why did you first get involved? I first heard of ISF from my mom two years ago, when I helped her with some ISF campaigns. Then I became a mobster last year. A mobster is a kid volunteer with ISF. We hear you don't like plastic straws. Why? And what does ISF do about that? Plastic straws might be small, but they are creating a huge problem. They are used once, then thrown away, and they end up in the ocean, and birds and other animals eat it. And it's so easy to prevent. This is the ISF Special Edition One World Glass Straw. The company Strawson donates $7 to ISF Straw Purchase. What programs have you specifically volunteered for? Ian does a lot of fan conventions, and ISF goes too. Last October, I helped at the ISF booth in Boston. One of my favorite parts is meeting people from across the world and working with them to help the environment and animals. It makes me feel like I'm making a difference and people care. 
We can all make a difference, no matter how old you are. This is Selena with Eco Defenders. We just spoke with Luke, volunteer for the Ian Somerhalder Foundation. Now back to Aqua Kids. Wasn't that great? Now it's your turn. If you or someone you know is doing something remarkable to help our planet, let us know about it. You could be our next Eco Defender. See you soon. Aqua Kids will be right back. For more information on today's show, go to aquakidstv.org. Welcome back to Aqua Kids. As our Great Lakes adventure continues, we're here at Old Woman Creek's National Estuarine Research Reserve, where we're going to be taking a tour of the facility, learning about the history of wetlands in the Great Lakes area. There's Old Woman Creek. Oh, yeah. There's Lake Erie. Hey, guys, how's it going? Hey, Drew. Hey. Nice display you got here. What do you use it for? Thanks. We use this to show exactly what wetlands do for us and for Lake Erie. You want to see? Absolutely. Yeah. All right, let's do this. Would you push some buttons for me? All right. When it rains here on the land, you can see our little rain clouds, it flows downhill because of gravity to a low spot. Our low spot here is Old Woman Creek. And when we get extra rain, the wetlands can hold that water. It'll fill up, those plants can be submerged, they're used to it. Eventually the water pressure will build up and shoot through our barrier beach and that water goes into Lake Erie. But the important part is all the time it spends here in the wetlands. All the sediments in the water have time to settle to the bottom and our plants are more than happy to, to use up some of those excess nutrients that came off of the surrounding land. So the water has plenty of time to clean up and it's extra fresh when it comes out. Yeah, our wetlands filter the water before it goes to Lake Erie. Are there many estuaries like this around Lake Erie? There are several estuaries around Lake Erie. You can see all these yellow dots represent estuaries in all of the Great Lakes. However, most of them are not naturally functioning as they used to be. A lot of them have been converted to marinas or housing developments or farmland. So that natural filtering wetland doesn't exist anymore. So human impact has played a bad role in Lake Erie in a whole. It has definitely changed how the system works. And that's why Old Woman Creek is so important because we still have our naturally functioning wetlands that filter the water. So how big really is the human impact on the lake? Since Ohio became a state, uh, we've lost 90% of our historic wetlands, mostly in the western basin of Lake Erie. So our focus now is figuring out how to add in some more of these features to landscapes so that we can work with things like agriculture and housing developments so that everybody benefits from everything. Like an artificial wetland? Yeah. What's up guys? Hey. What are we looking at? They found our map of historic wetlands in Ohio. Unfortunately, before people knew the value of wetlands, they were repurposed and we lost about 90% of our historic wetlands. You can see up here, this is our, one of our biggest rivers, the Maumee going into Lake Erie, and all of that was the Great Black Swamp. Uh, so we get about 80% of our sedimentation in Lake Erie from that river because the wetlands can't filter it out anymore because they don't exist there. Now over here in Old Wind Creek, that's where we still have our naturally functioning wetland and estuary that's helping filter some of the water. So what we gotta do is figure out some ways to put in some artificial wetlands, or what we call them, created wetlands, um, over there where they historically were. How do you make a created wetland? So it's just setting aside some land that isn't gonna be used for, for crops, that water can hang out and help filter with plants as it passes through the system. What's next on our tour, Jen? Well, we're gonna look at the Great Lakes as an entire system. Let's go. All right. Well, so here is a picture of, of all of the Great Lakes. They were created by glaciers about 14,000 years ago um, as the glaciers moved back up to the north as they receded. So Lake Erie was actually the first Great Lake that was ever made. Cool. Wow. That's an awful lot of fresh water there, isn't it? Yes, it is. It's 20% of the world's fresh water. That's why it's so important that we take good care of it. So where does all the water from Lake Erie come from? It actually comes from the upper Great Lakes. We get 80% of our water down here in the lower Great Lakes from the three upper Great Lakes. Aqua Kids will be right back. I'm Jeremiah, and this is Earth Edition. Since creatures first began roaming the Earth, 
The importance of water to all living things cannot be disputed. So it's important to understand how human progress has placed our water resources in peril. One example of this is Lake Erie, which by the 1960s had become critically polluted from factories, sewers, and agricultural runoff. Dead fish littered the shoreline and the Cuyahoga River actually caught on fire. The negative attention this brought to issues of water pollution back then forever changed the way Americans looked at ecology. Soon after that, conservation efforts began in Lake Erie region as well as across the U.S. The lessons we can learn from the 1960s headline, Lake Erie is dead, is to never allow our waterways to deteriorate to such an extreme condition because the water's condition impacts the human condition. I'm sorry to say that this episode's over, but it's important to know that each and every one of you at home can help make a difference, just like the people at the Old Woman Creek Research Reserve. Be sure to join us next week as our Great Lakes adventure continues on AquaKids.